אני מזמין את הרב סולובייצ'יק. אתה מבין מה שאני אומר, אבל ההרצאה של הרב סולובייצ'יק תהיה באנגלית. פשוט כבוד השופט, כבוד השופט, distinguished panelists, with gratitude to שחר for the wonderful invitation. In October of 1966, שי אגנון was informed that he had become the first Israeli to be awarded the Nobel Prize, and that he was expected in December at the court of King Gustav for the ceremony. Now, upon receiving the news, one might have imagined that Agnon would have much on his mind and much that he would be looking forward to. The New York Times in 1966, however, reported that Agnon was most excited about something unusual. This is what he said to the newspapers, quote, Because there is a benediction, one says before a king, and I have never met a king before. So this, he said, is my opportunity to say the bracha that you say, an amelech, ashenatan mi kvodol basar vadam. This is what he was most excited about. Now this may have been meant by Agnon whimsically, but I think that Agnon, with a keen literary sense, and so steeped in rabbinic literature, understood that the blessing embodied a profound reflection on the nature of leadership and the responsibilities of statesmanship. All too often those who work on biblical and Jewish political thought tend to see the Kohen in Tanakh as the archetypal spiritual leader and the Melech as a purely political figure. But this is clearly inaccurate. It's true, of course, that the Kohanim and the Mikdash are meant to be the legal leaders par excellence, Yoru Mishpatecha li Yaakov v'toratcha li Yisrael. But nevertheless, the Melech, unlike any other figure in Israel, is obligated to write a Sefer Torah and to carry it with him amongst the people. So not only a Kohen, but a Jewish king too, is meant to be a spiritual statesman. And it's to explicating this concept of spiritual leadership, one wholly different from the Kohen, that I'd like to briefly devote my remarks today. The most famous image of David Melech of King David in all of Western art, and perhaps the most famous sculpture in the world, is Michelangelo's David, standing 17 feet tall in the center of Florence in the Gallery dell'Academia, surrounded eternally by hordes of tourists who have come from all over the world to gaze enraptured at an Adonis-like David, poised perfectly and eternally in stone. It is a masterpiece. And yet, this widely known depiction of one of history's most famous kings and most famous Jews is not at all Jewish. As Simon Shammah has pointed out, sculptors of the Renaissance were primarily inspired by pagan antiquity. And so Michelangelo sought not to depict human beings as they were, but to approximate men to gods. And so here you have David HaMelech, 17 feet tall, seen by a million people a year, but not at all Jewish, a pagan god, not even Mahul, but nothing Jewish about him. And yet, the story of David HaMelech, and here is the irony, seeks to teach us the opposite approach to human grandeur and to royalty. Shmuel HaNavi comes to Beit Lechem to crown a new king. He seeks someone who is tall, like David in Florence, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to him in one of the most beautiful psukim in Tanakh, which means that royalty, it would seem, is for Judaism the opposite of what it is for Michelangelo. It is a matter not of height, but of heart. And in the expansion of the heart of the king to include the needs, physical and spiritual, of the people. Shlomo HaMelech similarly asks upon becoming king as a young man, Something I'm sure that the justices say every day when they seek to do what they need to do. In perhaps one of the most important statements on the Jewish monarchy in Halakha, Rambam, Maimonides writes that if al hasarat libo hikpidat Torah, if the Torah was so concerned about the heart of the king, it's because shelibo hu lev kol kahal Yisrael. The king's heart is the heart of the entire Jewish people. Meaning, that it is the expanding of one's heart beyond oneself that is the essence of leadership, the essence of royalty, 
and the essence of responsibility. There's a wonderful film, The King's Speech. Have you seen The King's Speech? So it depicts the King of England's relationship with his speech therapist, whose name is Lionel Logue. Now in order that they are equals during therapy, Logue insists on calling the king not king, but rather by a shame prati, so he calls him birdie. But they are not equals, of course, and the king does not call Lionel Logue Lionel. He calls him by a shame mishpacha, the way you would refer to your butler. He calls him the entire seret, he calls him Logue. And then at the end, when the king, thanks to Logue's help, successfully gives his wartime speech, first the king says, thank you, Logue. But then the king walks over and shakes Logue's hand, and he says, thank you, my friend. And only then does Logue respond, not, you're welcome, Bertie, but rather he says, thank you, your majesty. In other words, what's being expressed that it was precisely the king expanding his circle of friends beyond that which he would have often done. That is what made him majestic. In a similar sense, uh, my great uncle, Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, Rabbi Yosef Dov Soloveitchik, has noted in an essay on leadership that, quote, the Kabbalah equates the Shekhinah, the aspect of God that embodies the divine presence of God that dwells amidst the people on earth, with Malchut, royalty. This is st strange, he notes, because we would have thought the opposite that the transcendent aspect of God would be equated with royalty. But the opposite is so, because for Yahadut, he says, an open existence is a royal existence. The king resides in the midst of the people. He is always close to his subjects and accessible to them. Everybody and everyone may approach the king, widow, orphan, woodchopper, water drawer, vagabond, stranger, old timer, sinner, or thief. Each may complain to him, demand justice, and ask for help. So Judaism's concept of kingship and its relationship to responsibility to the populace is for the ancient world a revolution. The most famous tale regarding Shlomo HaMelech and his mishpat was of course the story of the two mothers. But what everyone always misses when they study this story is who were these two mothers? Az tavona shtayim nashim zonot el HaMelech. In the ancient world, kings are divinities. Their throne room is closed off to all but the elite. And here, two prostitutes enter the throne room of the king to seek justice. As Rav Soloveitchik points out, kingship in general historical terms precipitates the separation of the king from his people, his existential exclusiveness. But in Judaism, said Rav Soloveitchik, malchut means integration of the individual in the community and existential all-inclusiveness and openness. The king opens himself up to everyone and embraces the entire nation without excluding anybody. Melech libo lev kol ha'am. Malchut, said Rav Soloveitchik, requires of man not only to be aware of the existence of others, but also to feel, to experience their existence as if it were his own. And so here a contrast between Melech and Kohen, and particularly Melech and Kohen Gadol, begins to emerge. Kohen Gadol remains constantly in the Beit HaMikdash, Rambam writes, Ubayit yiyem muchan bamikdash. The Kohen Gadol would have what we call in English a timeshare in the Beit HaMikdash. He had his own bayit there. Ukvodo v'tifarto shiye yoshev b'beit HaMikdash v'lo yitzay ela l'beito bilvad. And then Rambam adds that even when he goes home, v'yye beito b'yerushalayim v'eino zaz misham. That's Rambam. He can never leave. The entire role of the Kohen is formed by cleaving to the sacred. In contrast, the Melech writes a Torah of his own, which he takes wherever he goes. But when he writes it, says Rambam, he brings it to the Mikdash first to check. This is the Sefer in the Beit HaMikdash. The symbolism is profound. The king's principles, his Torah, is formed by the tradition and by those, the Sanhedrin, who dwell amidst the holy. But then it is his duty as king to not only stay in the holy, but to bring the Torah's ideals to the world. This task is complex and it is immense. Isaiah Berlin, in one of his great essays called Political Judgments, wrote that in the realm of political action, there are few laws and what is needed instead is skill in reading a situation. Successful statesmen, he says, do not think in general terms. Instead, they grasp the unique combination of characteristics 
that constitute this particular situation, this and no others. They do not follow strict rules, but need to know how to relate to a particular situation. And Berlin's point has been interestingly applied by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs to Tanakh, where we are introduced to a korban chatat, a sin offering, for sins performed by judges, kohanim, and the nasi, the political leader. But only by the nasi does it not say, im, if the nasi sins, but rather, asher nasi yachta. Sin mistakes by the political leader is inevitable. Why? Says Rabbi Sachs, the high priest and the Sanhedrin were in constant contact with the holy. They lived in a world of ideals. The king or political ruler is, is in the world. The reason leaders as opposed to Kohanim cannot avoid making mistakes is that there is no textbook that infallibly teaches you how to lead. The most important thing from the Torah perspective is not that leaders never get it wrong, but that they are always exposed to prophetic critique and that they constantly study Torah to remind themselves of these transcendent standards and ultimate aims. And so what I want to suggest, in conclusion, is that the concept of melech has a ramification for the future of religious leadership. There is on the one hand a need for contemporary kohanim, who dwell in the yeshiva and the spiritual academy, divining the Torah and its laws like the kohen gadol. But then there is a need for Jewish leaders to bring the Torah to the world, to apply its concepts to people's lives. It was my own teacher, Rabbi Norman Lamb, the former president of Yeshiva University, who once said at a chagas micha, that the problem with too many of us in these shivot is that we have actually assimilated the narcissistic spirit of the time. We have become religious narcissists. We are too concerned with our own Torah growth, and the result of this spiritual introversion is an indifference, at times even an antipathy, to Jews who are unlike us. As a consequence, even those who admirably devote their lives to the teaching of Torah confine themselves all too often to preaching to the converted, and come to see themselves as halachic technicians. Their sense of responsibility, he says, for others' lives, physical as well as intellectual, worldly as well as, as, well as spiritual, psychological as well as scholarly, is inadequate. So Rabbi Lamb said 30 years ago, and that is all the more true today. When Shai Agnon went in December to collect his Nobel Prize, the ceremony was scheduled for Shabbat. And so he told King Gustav that he would be late. And so King Gustav sent a limousine to wait for him, to take him to the ceremony. Fortunately, in Sweden, Shabbat ended at 3.30 p.m. And so he was ready to go. But as soon as Shabbat was over, Agnon took his time. He said, Havdalah. Limousine was ordered by the king to take him to the ceremony. But Agnon was not yet ready because it was not only Shabbat, it was also Chanukah. And so he had to light the Chanukiah before he left. Then... He changed into tuxedo, went into the limousine, and they went with sirens blaring, taking him to the ceremony. The limousine, the regal crowd, car of the king, proved totally useless because Agnon had to sit in the front to plug in his shaver to take off the beard that he had grown over Shabbat. He arrived late just in time to receive the Nobel Prize for Literature. The rule is that you receive the award from the king and you say nothing, you back away from the royal presence. And the journalists saw him shocked. They were shocked to see him speaking words to the king. And so they said to Agnon, what did you say to the king? And he said, I was not talking to the king. I was talking to the Melech Malchei HaMlachim, saying the bracha that I had always wanted to say, Asher Natan Mikvodo Basar Vadam, reminding us that we are truly royal when we imitate HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Because Malchut in Judaism is not the limousine or the palace or even the prize. It lies in imitating Melech Malchei HaMlachim, whose Malchut is manifest in the Shekhinah that dwells amidst the people. We live in an age where statesmanship and spiritual leadership are so often separated, but we may hope to experience an age where they are united once again. Thank you.